Hello, this is Craig. Um, pardon the noise in the background, it's 90 and there's a marathon, so it's loud. Anyhow, I'm going to show you the RPG I've created, or at least two of the screens, the adventure screen and the battle screen. The adventure looks like a roguelike, except for there's an exception. It happens in real time, and your character follows your mouse around. Once you've left your starting block, you search all of these rooms for treasure. You're not likely to find treasure unless you hang around a little bit. So you saw that on the first pass I didn't really find anything, but on the second pass I found a lot. That's because you have to spend a little bit of time to search for treasure. And you can spend time like this, or you can spend time by going back and forth across them. Your choice. Cul-de-sacs have the most treasure, so you want to search those. But you can also see that the tiles are getting redder as I walk across them. That increases the chance of monsters, and we just ran into some. Uh, now, the, this battle is, is uh, pretty brutal uh, for our first battle, so we're going to go ahead and reload, and I'm going to get you an easier battle. That was not an easier battle. So, there we are. This is... I am not having very good luck with battles. Sorry. Uh, I'm looking for a really small battle against just one or two enemies. Alright, three zombies. That'll have to do. So, this is the battle screen. This game is a little bit unique in that you don't simply pick from a roster of moves that you have for each round. Instead, you have to project into the future. You have to submit a number of rounds into the future. Since I have four people on my team, I have to submit four rounds at the same time. The enemy has three people on their team, so they have to submit three at the same time. Now, every character has only three types of move, although these moves change as they build up momentum, basically as the battle goes on. So, for example, Agrin, which is the knight character, she has a slash, a hack, and a defend. We're at melee range, so the move we want to pick is the melee move. If we pick the skirmish move, nothing happens. Not only do we not deal damage, we also won't have any defense against incoming damage, aside from our base armor level. So melee attacks at melee range are the real key, but uh, how how come you wouldn't just pick melee? You could pick melee for everything and it would be like uh, just 16 boxes, boxes of melee and that would work great. But these guys are also in the fight and they're also picking. So if you're careful and you're smart, what you can do is you can change your range by defending. So defending will at the end of the turn change the combat's range from melee to skirmish or from skirmish to melee. And this happens any number of times, so if I defend twice, then it changes from melee to skirmish, and then skirmish back to melee, so that's not very useful. So what happens if we were to melee, and then defend? Now, when this girl gets a chance to go, she's not it's not yet in skirmish mode, because it don't, doesn't change until the end of the round. These all happen simultaneously, even though they're animated. So she has to melee to get it correct. But now, we're in skirmish mode. Now, why did I switch over into skirmish mode? because I know that these zombies, I know what they will do. When they're at melee mode, they simply submit melee. Melee, 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 melee. So I know that all nine of these boxes are going to end up being melee. By switching into skirmish, I can make them miss these two turns entirely. So when we get here, this is now going to be in skirmish. And when they start up again, I know that they're going to be able to do a skirmish situation. They're going to be able to react to that. And what they're going to end up doing is their rules for skirmish are a little bit different than their rules for melee. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of that by uh, skirmishing again. So you're going to see orange blobs fly across the screen and spark. The orange blobs are damage and the sparks are damage prevention. So you see that they can't even hurt some of my more strong characters. Oh, we're at skirmish range now, and they are missing with their melee attacks, and we are hitting with our skirmish attacks. And because they're missing with their melee attacks, they have no defense. Now we just annihilated that zombie. Alright, so the question now is, what next? There are a few things left here. First off, you can see that even though there's only one zombie, there's still Q for two. That doesn't matter. It's a, it's a minor, minor bug. Uh, one of the things to note is that my mage has gone from tier 1, like the rest of the characters, to tier 2. If you notice, she wasn't throwing any damage around, and that's because magicians at their first tier are typically very, very weak, and she's no exception. Instead, once she reaches tier 2, she starts to unleash the damage. 
This means that if you're a magician, you won't do anything for the first couple of rounds. You just want to make sure you choose the right attack because that's how you build up momentum. You can't defend because defending doesn't build up any momentum. Uh, crap, I just made a mistake. Uh, I know that this is going to be a block because uh, I happen to know how the zombies work. So I just I just screwed up and uh, while well, this round will go okay. Oh, well, I won, so it's okay. It works out fine. So those are the basic ideas. You're exploring this kind of dungeon and uh, and you're getting into fights. Now most of the time your heroes will stay damaged between fights. Uh, mine don't because I happen to be carrying around the four super heroes, the four main characters, and they all have a magic gem which gives them the power to regenerate. Um, now here I'm in a fight that's four on four. I don't really want to show you a four on four fight because that's pretty boring, but I do want to show you a four on lots fight. Now it's still four on four. So I'm going to go ahead and pop over to that boss tile. Uh, find one where the boss tile doesn't require me to walk through any, uh, any uh, red zones. Boss tile, here I come. Alright, so the boss, you see that the boss is five enemies, and that means that they are actually even slower than I am. I have to project four turns into the future, they have to project five turns into the future. Now, at this point, you already are familiar with the zombies, and you know what they'll do. Or at least I know what they'll do, I don't think I explained it very well. This is at skirmish range. All zombies follow the same pattern. All enemies always follow the same patterns, but which pattern it is depends on the enemy. For example, these guys, they're going to skirmish continuously. So I know that for these two, we're going to get skirmish and skirmish. It's going to be two long columns of skirmish. For the zombies, I know that they're going to skirmish once, and then they're going to block to try and change it to melee range, and then they're going to melee. So what that means is that uh, these guys are going to skirmish, and they're all going to block. So that's going to switch it from skirmish to melee, then from melee to skirmish, and then from skirmish back to melee. So at the end of the second round, we're going to be in melee range if I let them do that, and they will continue to melee. I'm going to let them do that because these guys are still going to be skirmishing, and at melee range, skirmishers, are the, you're playing the wrong move. You're going to, to suck down the damage, and I'm just fine with that. So we've got two rounds of skirmishing, and at the end of the second round, the zombies have switched it to melee. Let's see how our luck holds out. Although there's no luck involved at any point, there's not even one random element in these battles. Now the Dullahans are the heaviest hitters with the heaviest armor that I've yet implemented, so you can see that the four poor rogue can't even hurt them. Uh, not until he levels up to the next tier, at least. Now the Magician is almost leveled to the second tier. She's about to unleash her magic. Alright, so now I know that what's going to happen is we're going to have two skirmishes and some melee, and then they're going to get a chance to go again. So what I want to do is I want to trick them into the skirmish move again. So I'm going to melee, melee, defend, and melee. Now at the end of this turn, this will be skirmish, and they're going to be loading up uh, their moveset again with a bundle of skirmishes, and we know how that goes already. So they're going to be one round of skirmishes, another round of skirmishes while the zombies block, and then a round of melee. And let's hope I don't kill off any of the zombies. Uh, and when I said there are no random elements, I was lying because you, you, who you target is somewhat random. So here we're at skirmish, and they have loaded up on skirmishes, as I have predicted. And now we're going to see two skirmishes and three blocks. And then I'm going to attack and oh, I just killed off the zombies. You see the magician is in high form, just slaying enemies with her my, a more high-powered magic. But now that there's only three enemies left, we can just go ahead and melee. And we'll just um, annihilate these enemies and complete the adventure. Unfortunately, completing the adventure doesn't take us back to the town or anything because we don't have that implemented yet. But I thought this was an interesting idea. The characters only have three moves, um, although those moves can be upgraded as you gain momentum. So what that means is that uh, your individual characters are quite simple, and oftentimes you're only going to want to go into the field with one or two because that keeps your response time quite nimble. Especially if you're fighting enemies you're not very familiar with, you want to be able to react when they change it from skirmish to melee, or melee to skirmish, without you noticing. So if you're queuing up for four characters, 
and one of the enemies changes it and you didn't expect it, then you've got like two or three more rounds of characters getting the actions wrong and dying. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of an interesting way to play the game. Uh, the enemies, the actions of the enemies are much more important than they are in other games. Rather than simply being a bundle of stats, you have to know what they're going to do in combat. And the larger your party, the more you have to know about what they're going to do. And of course, if there's lots of them, you can take advantage of their slow response time to set them up for those chain kills like I did in that last boss fight, where they were wrong for three or four turns in a row. That's what I'm working on, and I hope you enjoyed it.